Hey, I'm Wajah Ali, and this is Waj Invades America. Today, we're going to talk about how you can survive in this country. Later, I'll be speaking to Christina Greer about how you can broach white supremacy with your problematic white friends. But first, a public service announcement. Oh, well, hello there. You know, at night, I like to wind down and get on Twitter to relax. I also like to give back to the community. Oftentimes, people say, "Wow, you're so generous. You give so much. You're a philanthropist." I say, "No, no, no. I'm just a man of the people." And so, right now, I'll be answering your questions. The first is a tweet, an image sent by at Shane Fontaine Seven. Keith Connolly. I'm assuming he knows that I'm a fan of Legos. All the cool kids do Lego. This is a fictional set of the Capital Invasion, 10,621 pieces. My response to this is, if this was made in 2022, all of these violent insurrectionists would actually be elected to the House and the Senate as Republicans. And you don't need 10,621 pieces. You just need a few hundred. At De Fishman, struggling artist, starving writer. Sorry that you're struggling, and I hope that you can eat. Eat some fiber. I assume the Rick Wilson will be one of your guests. I would love to have the Rick Wilson as one of my guests. Rick Wilson, as you know, is a former Republican who is now part of the Lincoln Project, trying to do his best to go against the fascist GOP that he helped create. We became famous because on CNN we made Don Lemon lose his shit. For two minutes, because we were hilarious, and we got a whole bunch of hate mail, and the RNC and the GOP used us in ads, and Donald Trump tweeted against us, which was lovely. Equa at Equa Odi writes, "What would you say to people who believe that contributing to the normalization of anti-white bigotry on Twitter and in the media is not helpful or positive, but in fact is harmful?" Thank you for that passive-aggressive tweet, Equa. You also tweet two of my tweets. I apparently wrote, "I see a lot of white people without masks. Coronavirus will feast tonight." And another one. Question is, why did this project? I'm assuming the 1619 project upset so many of the white people. Dear Equa, when people of color complain about white supremacy or the whiteness or racism. We do not hate white people. Some of us think we are white. We're just calling out the double standards to make this country equal and fair for everybody else. Thank you, Equa, and keep tweeting with that passive-aggressive rage and subtlety. Well, until next time, keep sending me your thoughts, suggestions, and questions using the hashtag #DearWatch. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by an academic who's also cool and can rock yellow on a set. Dr. Christina Greer of Fordham University joins me. She's the author of Black Ethnics and host of The Blackest Questions. Christina, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. All right, so in the power vested in me by myself, I'm going to make you the sole representative and authority of all Black women in America. Love it. Okay, great. <laughs> First question. As a sole representative of all Black women, if white MAGA supporters、mm. had to live as Black women in America, how long would they last until they burned the country down? They had to live as Black women. Well, first of all, Black women wouldn't burn the country down、Ooh. because we're the ones who consistently build this country.、Mm. I mean. Just as James Baldwin told us, it's like black people are the ones who actually have the most faith in this nation, the most patriotism. Like we believe in this country even when the country doesn't believe in us. So black women are the keepers of democracy. Dare I say the Democratic Party as well? So if these MAGA people turn to be black American women, then they probably, hopefully, would sow the seeds of some small D Democratic principles, and we'd actually be in a totally different direction. I like that Jedi mind <laughs> trick, and I like how you played that. It was very well played. <laughs> The question, though, I have is if if they knew, right? I'm specifically talking about this MAGA Republican because right now, as we're having this conversation, 
they're threatening civil war, mm -hmm. right? Right now, as we're having this conversation, the big lie is mainstream. Right now, as we're having this conversation, people think Trump won the election. He did not. He lost. And there is this perpetual rage and victimhood mm -hmm. that this country is against them. And I see that and I'm like, actually, historically, the people who have been most oppressed are black folks. Mm -hmm. And they have to love a country that doesn't love them back. Mm -hmm. And so if you can do that Jedi mind trick with them, what would you like to tell them about victimhood and oppression? Right, because so many of these people are the victims and the heroes of their own narrative. Mm. America has a very unique space in that we are always going to have a dichotomous relationship between black people and white people. We obviously have loads of other racial and ethnic You think groups. always? Always. Mm. Because this country, as Bell Hooks has told us, is predicated on white supremacy, anti-black racism, patriarchy, and capitalism. And white supremacy encapsulates how white people treat lots of other groups, including black people. But there's a very specific anti-black racism that exists literally in the soil of this nation that I don't think that we'll ever be able to fully move beyond, especially in this particular moment where we have someone like the former president really excavating mm. the worst that has always been in our nation. It's not like these people just like came out of nowhere. They're from a long lineage of folks. And it's not just the South, right? As Malcolm X <laughs> yeah. says, it's like anything South of the Canadian border is the American <laughs> South because it's a whole collective project. So in this moment that I find very frightening, I don't know if this particular type of white person fully understands what equity means because they see it as, you know, it's a pie. If I have a piece, then that means they have a less than a piece. Right. That's actually not how it works. But because so much of their existence has been without competition right. from women, people of color, women of color in particular, and it feels like all these people are getting stuff for free. Where? Where's the free stuff? I have no idea where this is. Student loan debt. You got it as a gift from God, you right. know. But I mean, but we also know that black folks have more student loan debt That's than right. others. So we're talking about these examples of inequities, right? How we want to explain to our moderate white friends that white supremacy exists. Why are we incapable in this country, in the United States, to even talk about it or even mention the R word? Right. This country to me is so fascinating and unique. This is why I study it. I'm fascinated by it. I mean, mm. I've gone to school with white people almost my entire life. You've studied um, white people. I, I know white people more than white people know white people. I'm just gonna, like, that, I mean, that has always been my crux. I don't think white people fully understand the capacity of white people. I don't think they understand American history. I don't mm -hmm. think they know American history. I don't think they really understand what's gone on. You know, when you think about someone like Ruby Bridges who integrated the Louisiana public school system, it's like how you could sort of throw racial slurs and trash at a six-year-old baby right. who's going to school. Like, you don't understand the depths to which like, people would try and kill the, the, uh, the kids who integrated Well, uh, the, the, the girls Kansas. at Little Rock. Exactly. So I think we're in a moment right now where I'm trying to understand the complete picture of mm -hmm. what this nation is and has been as someone who studies American politics. So, you know, we have like the founding fathers. It's like they were rapists and, and, and enslavers. Slavers. Enslavers, yeah. Enslavers, like George Washington pulled the teeth out of his enslaved Africans and mm. put them in his mouth. But you're taught, oh, he was wearing wooden teeth. Isn't that cute? And so I, I find myself having to undo a lot of the narratives to sort of have a blank slate to then try and introduce the reality of what this country has been. And it's a lot for me to even process. Well, you know, when you talk about history, I have to talk about this because the, the power of a story mm -hmm. and how proof that stories and books are so powerful, the attack on books right now. Right. As we're talking, right. I think more than 1,100 books have been banned in the past year. Mm -hmm. There's an attack on the CRT boogeyman, mm -hmm. right? Toni Morrison's beloved is more terrifying than gun violence in Virginia, right? What is it about history, the real history mm -hmm. of America that unravels and terrifies and angers white supremacy? Because it exposes the truth. I mean, we read to know we're not alone, right? Is that E.B. White or C.S. Lewis? One of those. One I, of them. I love that. Yeah. But with a lot of these novels, they actually are giving us a more accurate portrait of what this, this country has been. You know, you think about Mark Twain, my favorite author, by the way. Oh, um, all right. But, you know, because he was always so broke, he wrote in a way where it's like if you're a staunch abolitionist or you're a staunch segregationist, you could sort of see whatever narrative you want. It's like see. a popcorn, right? Yeah. You, 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 it's like one of those popcorn movies, but he throws in the message. Yeah. Well, but also it's a hologram. 
Because if you're a racist, you you sort of see what you want to see. And if you're an abolitionist, you see what you want to see. He's writing because he's like, I got to make some money. But I think this country has never really ever grappled with like what we've done to people. Mm. Mass genocide on our soil. Turning people away during the Holocaust. Mm. U.S. chattel slavery for centuries, right? I mean, we've got marine life on the East Coast only because of the, the U.S. slave trade. Like, we've got sharks and... and Plankton and algae that shouldn't even be over here, but like because it was such an endeavor, an economic endeavor. So like this is where all of a sudden capitalism comes in. So like to to try and give people my twenty some odd years of knowledge of yeah. like reading this and studying this and thinking about it and grappling with it and really like going through all the the hurt and confusion and enlightenment to sort of sum it up at the Thanksgiving dinner table doesn't do the story justice. But I think, you know, part of the podcast is like, black history is American history. Right. And the same way that it's not taught in school, it's like, I'm, you know, my parents obviously supplemented vast pockets of my education at home because they knew I wasn't getting it in school. But like, white people should be angry that they don't know black history. Like, it shouldn't just be black people celebrating February, Black History Month. It's like, white people should be mad that they actually don't know the complete story of this nation. And that their kids are no longer going to read books in public schools. But I think that there's an anti-intellectualism that goes along with white supremacy because that's the only way the project works. You have to sort of keep people in the dark so that they can just kind of be these rote individuals who just like, it's like, yes, I hate them. Not too sure why. Can't really give a CRT scares me. Right. Can't define it. But you know, when you when you interview these white supremacists who used to be, you know, hardcore white supremacists and they've they've had some sort of enlightenment awaken, yeah. awakening awakening yeah, yeah. and they're like they And denounce, they exist. We have to be honest, but they, they do exist. People they denounce who, and they yeah. renounce. And it always has to do with I met someone and I started reading and I met more people and I started reading some more. That's how it works. Always. So this banning of books goes perfectly with the moment that we're in because you're keeping people beyond ignorant, and that's how you can sort of keep them doing and saying whatever it is. What's well, the them power to do. of stories? And, and you mentioned something to me that stuck with me in the, the beginning of this conversation. You talked about how this anti-blackness is rooted in the soil, and you use the word always. There's always going to be this tension, mm -hmm. right? And I asked you this because a, a poll that came out in the summer, a survey says about a half of Americans think that we're going to have another civil war. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted your thoughts on that. Do you think another civil war is inevitable? Does there have to be like a, a divorce? Can we have a separation? Like how do we, we can't just cleave off a third of America that yeah. believes in the big lie and that Donald Trump is a great mega king. Uh, you can't just snap them away. What do we do? I think we also have to redefine what a civil war is because I might argue that we're kind of in one. Mm. I think a lot of people think civil war is like, you know, you've got on a color and I've got on a color. We've taken up arms and it's, you know, it looks like 1864 all over again. We like, load up our muskets. Yeah, but it's like we're in a moment right now where it's just like we we are in two camps. Right. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people in the media have failed us. because they're like, Well, you know, both sides are angry. <laughs> no, that's that's actually not where we are. You know, going back to my point, a lot of journalists don't understand the capacity of these MAGA Republicans. Why like, is that? Because they can look at January 6th and say like, wow, that was a lot. But you know, my uncle was really upset too. See, you're shifting, yeah. right? You're not understanding that these people went to our nation's capital, what used to be a majority black city, by the way. And it's Chocolate like, city. Chocolate city. And like, they're saying that they would have killed Nancy Pelosi and Mike Pence, right? And Mike Pence is the whitest man on earth. Quite, with an H. Right. It's pronounced, right? And so... I think that a lot of folks still see it's like, well, because they, you know, keep in mind, we're not privy to white conversations, right. white, white conversations. I'm but not we, in the white WhatsApp group. We get snippets right. of there's a real sympathy and empathy that a lot of people have for MAGA Republicans, for January 6th insurrectionists, because they see themselves and their family members right. in these individuals. And no one's a villain. No. They're not bad guys. No, they're not. They don't have horns on their head. Right. But they're also not doing the heavy lifting to make sure that this doesn't escalate. And it's escalating. Can I ask you this question? If it were black folks and Muslim folks who did generous, <laughs> let me finish, <laughs> who did the January 6th violent insurrection mm -hmm. and promoted the big lie and were part of the ongoing coup, how would America respond? Well, as, as I ask you as a nerd historian. Most Americans don't know about the MOVE movement in Philadelphia where they dropped a bomb 
uh, in the middle of the city of Philadelphia and killed women and children. Mm. Uh, this is sort of, if you kind of know anything about um, Mumia Abdul-Jamal, was sort yeah. of part of this kind of group of individuals that, you know, the city of Philadelphia and the mayor and then the federal government saw as a threat. And so they bombed them mm. in the middle of a city, a U.S. city. Mm. America bombed their own city and killed black men, women, and children. That is, they would have bombed the Capitol. <laughs> it would have been over by 215. Done. Done. They would have had time for lunch. Done. Mm. Like, I mean, because the thing is, you know that on January 6th, at least in all my text chains, with, with folks of color, everything was, let there be some black folks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, malls now say that more than three black people can't walk together, right. you know, because you're a gang. Yeah. Like, hundreds of black people armed? It's over. Armed. I know. Kicking in windows. Chanting that they're going to kill someone. Threatening cops. I mean, this is, you know, if you go on YouTube and, and people have put together compilations of like white people evading the cops, because on the one hand, it's it, like, it makes you just sort of chuckle until you realize it's like, oh, no, no, no. You make a furtive movement. I make a furtive movement. We're on the ground if we're lucky. Right. Right. I mean, bullets will fly immediately. This is white folks grabbing guns, slapping cops, running around like Benny Hill. Like, you just get the benefit of the doubt, right? And so we know I, that- I, I can't even, I have a fertile imagination. I always tell people, I can't even imagine can't. Muslims and black you folks can't. doing this. I can't even imagine you and me going with a bunch of like black, brown, bearded folks and just like okay. saying nice things in Arabic. Like a thousand folks. Please. Like, we, like there'd be chalk Please. lines. Or, or having members of Congress, it's like, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene, this is a white Christian nationalist nation. So it's like, this is a Muslim. There's nothing in the Constitution anywhere that says that we're a white Christian nationalist nation by any stretch of the imagination. But if, if you're like, this is a Muslim nation. Allahu Akbar. Right. Hey. Right? And so I Julio think. Julio would take away funding for the show. <laughs> like, I see you, Julio. All of a sudden, I That's start why he's sweating moving for the first my chair time back. ever. I see you. The corner of my eye, I see everything. But. I mean, that's the thing. Our imaginations can't even go there. That's right. We can't. And so the fact that you know every single time when it's a white person who's done something because they're in police custody. Mm. So when we think about the tragedy in Buffalo. Police custody. You just killed almost a dozen people. Dylan Roof. Not just police custody. Burger King. Mm. Burger King. Like, oh, well, he's just a boy. Right? And so... but. Tamir Rice, who's 11, was a man with a gun. That's right. Shot so, within three seconds. Three seconds. Yeah. So, and then to what, going back to your original question, to walk people through why it is that we want to keep talking about this. It's like, so to know that an 11 year old can get shot in three seconds has to do something to your body. So when we talk about like health effects, when we think about sort of high blood pressure or hypertension or fibroids, right, or diabetes, it's like, all this is internalized. And so this movement of like, you know, black joy, some folks are just like, you know, what is that all about? And it's like, well, it is, ha it has to be deliberate. Yeah. I'm very serious about like rest. Like my friends are like, oh girl, you vacation. It's like, yes, I do. Because this world, this country in particular, isn't gonna put me into an early grave. Can I ask you a question? What gives you joy right now? Um, I've started to travel again. I mean, Mark Twain is my favorite author. And so just like Mark Twain. On a steamboat, you're gone? I mean, <laughs> maybe one day. But, you know, not with COVID. I could never yeah. imagine getting on a cruise. But he would always leave the United States to write, to think. And then he'd come back and, you know, write about race and racism and, you know, black relations in the, in the United States. I have to leave America to have better thoughts about mm. America. Well, so James really, Baldwin had to leave. Well, and like Khalil Gibran says, like the mountain is clearer to the climber when the climber leaves the mountain. So like, mm. I literally have to physically be away from the country so I can sort of see it and sort of see my place in it, see what's happening in a much more clear fashion. So COVID lockdown was very hard for me intellectually because I felt like I was, I'm trapped mm. in this country and I need to leave it to love it. This is a segment of the show we call First Impressions. Okay. Don't think too much. I know you're an academic, super smart. Just hit me. Keep okay. it raw, keep it real. Here we go. Tucker Carlson. Insecure. Meg the Stallion. Beautiful. Potato salad with raisins. Travesty. The Green Book, the movie. Unwatchable. Unwatchable? Damn. 
white hero. We're going to have a book about <laughs> the green book, but make it about a white hero. Get out of here. The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. Ah, 1998. I was a freshman in college. Fantastic album. Amazing. Amazing. I mean, Still great. I won't tell you how old I was. Uh, it's, we're same-ish age. Blue Lives Matter. Flag. Black Lives Matter. Co-opted. Mm. MAGA. Hats. <laughs> CRT. Books. White Women. Dangerous. The Bluest Eye. Mm. Ooh. You're not limited to words. You can, you can. Yeah. Um, it hurts my heart. Mm. Senator Tim Scott. Oof. I can't say the word. <laughs> you can say it. It's a safe space. <laughs> what, um, I want to say it, but let's just say there's an animal that looks like a bandit. <laughs> Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. Potential. When they go low, we go high. Empty slogan. The Rust Belt. America. All right. Here's a segment where we get to know a little bit more about our guest. Go to favorite movie that was not critically acclaimed that if you admit it in public would be cringeworthy, but it makes you smile and it gives you joy. Hmm. So everyone knows that Coming to America, hands down, is my favorite movie. Um, also critically acclaimed. Yeah. My second favorite movie is Royal Tenenbaums. I'm a huge Wes Anderson. It's a great movie. Thanks. It's my favorite Anderson movie. Uh, yeah. By the way. There's, there are a lot of layers in that one. But I mean, listen, I'm a huge Adam Sandler, old school Adam Sandler. So I would- Favorite old school Adam Sandler movie. Happy Gilmore. All right. Can't go wrong. Uh, go to advice you give to a young person who's just seeking direction in life. Drive cross country. Hmm. And uh, get robbed. <laughs> in, in that order. Right. I tell them three things. It's like you have to work on a campaign at some point just to see all the good and bad that happens on a campaign. Um, drive cross country to see how one person's supposed to unify this incredibly diverse nation, not just with people, but like geographically, we're so diverse. We've got deserts and mountains and forests and beautiful country. Beautiful. This country is beautiful. Stunning. Um, and then, you know, at some point, you'll get robbed, and it's, it needs to happen, just so you realize things are merely things. If you could invade and take over one state or city and remake it, which one would it be? Ooh, Baltimore, my favorite city. And remake it how? Um, well, one, architecturally, I would just sort of clean, clean certain buildings and fill in some of the empty lots. Mm. Uh, in the style that was formerly sort of part of Baltimore glory. Um, and then they're operating under population. So I would mm. try and figure out how to get the city back to its full population. And final question, since this is a show that brings America together, we're a healing show. We're uniters, not dividers. <laughs> I would like you to look into the camera mm -hmm. and give sage advice to the white moderates who will go to their white families and, and tell them how they can be good allies. What would I tell white moderates? You know, you have to sit in the discomfort hmm. and you have to sit at the table sometimes a little longer than makes you comfortable. That's what I would say. Professor Christina Greer, the first person of color <laughs> in her department at Fordham University, author, the book is, Black Ethnics. Where can they find it? Anywhere books are sold. And the weekly podcast is? The Blackest Questions. And where can they find it? On Spotify, the Grio Podcast Network, anywhere you find your podcast. And where can Fox News fans troll you on Twitter? Oh, jeez. Yeah, they're already there. But it's dr underscore cm greer, g-r-e-e-r. -E -E Dr. Greer. Well, that's all for now. But before we head out, I want to give you my three takeaways from today's show to help you become a better and more tasty American. Takeaway number one. Immigrants got to daft punk it through life. They have to do everything harder, better, faster, and stronger just to make it. Takeaway number two. If your friends doubt this thing called white privilege exists, 
Just ask them if a guy like me would survive invading the U.S. Capitol. Takeaway number three. We hate, and I mean hate, hate white supremacy. But both Professor Greer and I love Royal Tenenbaums and Happy Gilmore, two of the whitest movies on Earth. That's all for now. Until next time, this is Waj Invades America. I'm Wajahatul.